Hi everyone, this is a read loud session of MEG03 Block 1 Henry Fielding Tom Jones Unit 1 that is some aspects of fiction. The structure of this unit 1 is objectives, introduction, the novel, the novel as fiction, fiction as history, the evolution of the novel, some problems, shift to prose in 18th century, the novel as a new literary form, the novel as a comedy, and then let us sum up. Let's begin by reading ob the 1.0 section objectives. As the word fiction poses problems, the aim of this unit is to examine the relationship between fictional and realistic depictions. The novel can be seen as dealing with the questions, issues, as well as with the facts of the history. The 18th century is the century of prose as well as the rise of the novel, with both prose and the novel focusing on the common ways of life. The novel emerged as a new and significant mode of writing, becoming more than a means of providing entertainment. It became a means of radical questioning that would lead to a change in entrenched attitudes. The aim is to discuss these questions in the course of this unit. 1.1 Introduction This is the first unit of the first block in your course on the British novel. As such, you will find that we discuss some basic issues here which will help you to understand not just Tom Jones but also subsequent novels prescribed. So go through each section carefully and critically. Now that you are doing a master's degree, you will need to read widely and variously. Try and find some of the books on the novel recommended at the end of the block from your local library and try to read this alongside this unit. It's not compulsory for you to read these books, but reading them will certainly enhance your understanding of the novel as a literary form. 1.2 Novel The novel as a fiction? As against imaginative or fictional, the novel is a realistic form. It presents the segment of life and society in more or less approximate terms which has been seen and experienced by actual men and women of the particular period. The concept of mirroring or reflecting an object is more significant in case of the novel than it would be in the case of poetry or drama. There is indeed the assumption that the so social situation <coughs> with its problem and issues is faithfully recorded in the novel and that the reader does not come across any major flights of imagination on the part of the writer. Also in the novel, there are no concentrated description that points toward the dark recesses of the mind, the mysterious of the soul as it were. At the time of the writing, the novelist seemed to have definitely concluded that his man and woman are of the day-to-day -day kind, walking, chatting, moving around, without the high furnished of the soul, psyche or mind. They seldom poet type poeticize or see themselves in the heroic mode. While pursuing their ordinary goals of securing, securing bread and butter, which entails most of their waking hours, the peasants, the craftsmen, the traders of the specific social world are part of the mundane situations. The job of the novelist is to see how these people conduct themselves. Enmeshed as they were, they are in their specific surroundings. While reading a novel, we may feel that we have been transported to a different world with its own laws, rules, and regulations. Towns and villages, markets, street and pathways hold out as actual places with their distinct coloring and feel. Yes, the emphasis is on actuality. Not only are the people shown as speaking with their very own mannerisms, but ordinary information about their appearance, condition, opinion, and the state of mind also is imparted by the author 
in his or her own voice. This second aspect of the writer's practice implies that the describing person, the novelist, has an opinion and a point of view according to which she or he judges without much scruple the action of the different characters selected. Consciously and with ostensible purpose for presentation. The judgment of the writer is biased as all judgments are. The biases obviously indicate that the writer is totally immersed in the overall fate of the characters as well as the effect of their behavior on the life and the nature of the society. In this sense, the writer can be seen as a responsible member of the actual society of that time as well as the society reflected in the novel. The remarks of the author meant clearly for sharing with read reader land and uh, uh, sorry I'll repeat this part again. The remarks of the author meant clearly for sharing with the reader lend authenticity to the description in the novel and make the reader accept it as a truthful account. This leads to the state in which the reader is strongly drawn into the ethos of the word of the novel. In the course of reading a novel, therefore, the reader may feel that he or she is a witness to an actual happening in which a real person had been involved. The words in the text to do, text do, uh, the words in the text do not merely signify something outside of or away from them. Instead, the words are there on the page as a picture or picture which introduce the reader to their world and bind him or her to its specific aspects. This is no wonder that the reader of the novel would get fully absorbed in the goings of the world chosen for representation in the world. This is what I mean by novel as a realistic form. Imaginative, on the other hand, denotes an unreal, unreal thing, a creation of the mind of a person gifted with an unusually inventive and powerful imagination. It is also suggested that the word in the text under the imaginative category have to be taken as tools and that the artist works with their help to fulfill his or her specific artistic, moral or spiritual purpose. This purpose may be to produce a literary work of exceptional symbolic spiritual significance. What is fictional then? The word invented or invention is yet more meaningful in this case. It denotes that the account of the presented in a work bears no relation with the reality of life as we know it. It is imaginative and more, it is fictional. In this sense, the fictional would be more appropriate a turn for poetry. Isn't fiction a non-fact a lie? Most of us wish to leave the existing world of hard routine and drudgery so that we move to the another in which we can do what we like, where wishes would be horses. We also notice that the maker of the lie, a liar, is an interesting per person as against one who preaches high morality. Have we watched the behavior of a liar closely? If we have, we would mark that a liar Compulsive liar is one who is mentally alert and all the time note, notes changes in the faces of the listeners who keeps a track of their moods and constantly struggles to find out what his or her audience wishes to hear. The liar accordingly modifies the lie as it is in progress. This is because of the fact that the liar is highly inventive and imaginative. But there is difference. While poetry and drama are also invented and imagined, they cannot be equated with a lie. On the other hand, they are high truths. It is not because of this lie aspect of the novel has been associated with fiction. While poetry and drama talk about the truth, the universal all-embracing wisdom the novel as a fictional piece may rest content 
may rest content with presenting an ordinary life situation. In this way, the irony behind the fictional piece cannot be missed, or can it? 1.2.2 Fiction as History The fiction of fictional has come to acquire such strong affinities with the novel that we use the two synonymously. Walter Allen, in his book, The English Novel, has drawn our attention in this regard to the issue of the artistic representation. The way a writer gives a shape to an experience in her or his work, characters in a novel symbolize specific attitudes in which in a given society and the writer conveys through them those significant impression which she or he has gathered from surroundings. The characters and social impressions merge into each other and the end product strongly binds us to the represented action. But the writer does not merely gather impressions from life. What happens is that impressions precede characters and are in fact molded and remade into the characters by the author. In this sense, they are truly fictional. Molding and remaking imply that the author's imagination has been at work in an intense manner. There is also a problem of plausible, lifelike situation that the writer is supposed to invent. This means that the characters in the novel cannot be constructed and rendered flesh and blood unless they are place of, placed in identifiable cir cir circumstances of, the wor of our own world. I'll repeat this line again. This means that the characters in the novel cannot be constructed and rendered flesh and blood unless they are placed in the identifiable circumstances of our own world. The men and women, the men and women in work of fiction became our links with the period in which the writer has lived and stand for those actual trends that existed at the time. Through Allworthy, Western, Jones, and Bill Phil in Tom Jones, for instance, we gain close familiarity with the developments in the 18th century England. The process is complex, but the truth is quite simple. In a peculiar way, the actual circumstance the society of a period becomes a necessary component of fiction. Fiction becomes significant history. That is how the line between the imaginative and the real gets blurred and the history intrudes inevitably into fiction. In Walter Allen's words, perhaps character was never anything more than literary exercise, but its relation to novel is obvious. The first magnificent fruit of its marriage with reality, however, is seen in works of history, especially in the great portrait gallery of Clarendon's History of the Rebellion. This was inevitable before the novel, which must to a greater or less degree be an imi imitation of actual work, could be born. There had to be works already in existence which were not imitations, that is not fiction, but faithfully description, the faithful descriptions of the actual world. So, among the strongest influences on what was becoming the novels were works of history like Clarendon's and Soberly's caref soberly careful accounts of the real life adventure, distant countries and strange peoples like Dampier's A New Voyage Round the World. The question posed here is whether fiction comes to gradually resemble history or to put in another way, history becomes the all important subject of fiction. We can take the argument onto another plane and say that around the 18th century in England, history becomes a matter of vital interest for the common writer who sets out to do justice to its, to its to it by focusing upon the behavior and the problems of the ordinary man and women. However, the novel is different from, different from the history in one important respect. 
history as we see it is long continuous process without a clear tangible beginning as well as an end it goes on unfolding itself beyond its specific actors of a period its men and women who are active within it to influence and change it on the other hand novel begins at the particular point of life in society as well as the end of ends at the another point those two points in the novel recognized and chosen by author are extremely significant because between them lies the segment of social life captured as it has been through words which vibrates with the meaning at the every turn and also contains within itself a totality and a certain truth it is significant difference between history it is a significant uh, sorry i'll repeat again it is a significant difference between history the life of actual people at a given time and a literary work in the examination the students are generally asked to comment on the ending of the novel and tell the truth that has been constructed with its help why because it is assumed and rightly perhaps that the end matters in the terms of lesson which the novelist set out to convey to the reader replace the word lesson with the word moral and what we have is a fable which has to establish a useful aspect of human wisdom relevant to the period in which the writer lived the reader gains this wisdom by virtue of arduously following the course of the events depicted in the novel and sees that the author consciously took him on a specific journey in imagination the same thing can be perceived in an account of history but with less emphasis since the historian is much more answerable to the actuality of the events the social historical reality of the period under study in history moral lessons can be noticed as merely scattered and the person the historian if he chooses to clearly underline these morals can be accused of violating laws of objectivity he may face the accusation of allow, allowing subjective biases to the play the decisive role in the presentation of the historical account yes there are lessons in history but they are tentative creations of course no useful study of history is possible without them of the perceiver or the interpreter not of history as such for instance a specific understanding of the history can be countered by another understanding you can see contrasting lessons conveyed by another interpreter of the same period in history this is because history is no single person's or group's creation in fact being a bigger continuum it is not the creation of any person group or even the whole society of the specific period simply taken it is found there when it is found there when we are born and it would hopefully be there when we die in contrast novel is an author's creation it entirely belongs to him or her if the individual so wished the writing of the novel could be indefinitely deferred or the idea altogether discarded such is the grip and the bind of the author on the novel on its writings starting from the idea of the fictional piece the author gave it slant and direction one can go to the extent of saying that the author has a large number of alternative strategies to choose from this means that shaping of the novel involves a great deal of flexibility 1.3 the evolution of the novel 1.3.1 some problems it is useful to go into the history or the genesis of the novel in england there are large number of books on the subject that provide good information about prose works in the 16th and 17th centuries the idea in these books is that prose works of the earlier period can be clearly linked up with the novel 
of the 18th century. The common point between these uh, between the two seems to be prose. Then there are stories of discovery, exploration and adventure which also have laid claims to parenting this modern literary form. It is suggested that the spirit of curiosity necessitated <laughs> sorry I'll I'll try to pronounce it better necessitated 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 actually yeah it is suggested that the spirit of curiosity necessitated a loose fictional form which provided enough scope to the writer to collect information as well as information as well as to question analyze and assess the new material these stories centered around the wandering rogue a rootless untied persona whose fascination for new and unknown places could hold immense appeal for the reader add to them the imaginary totally fictional piece written by their author in different countries of europe to s entertain the reader taking him or her on an imaginary voyage to the world of mystery wonder and magic in these Nothing real was intended for the projection, their fundamental motive being to give pleasure. Curiosity, suspense, and storytelling were supposed to bring these writings closer to the novel. In this context, all one can say is that, important as these imaginative efforts are in, the, in their res respective language and periods, they scarcely enlighten us about the emergence of the novel. All that has come in the wake of such a venture is mere guesswork. In fact, the fault in such a genesis tracing exercise is that it is based on the erroneous concept of literary history. The term literary history denotes that there is a direct linkage within literature between works written in the past with those written later and that in a matter of manner of saying, literature produces produces out of itself. There is also a tendency among scholars of the literature these days of going to philosophical writings of the period in which specific literary work were composed. This is done with a view to explaining how a particular writer's sensibility was molded by those philosophical writings and trends. The suggestion is that Apart from the literary works already existing, it is philosophical tendencies which produce new literature. Under this scheme, the author is merely seen as molding the available literary material to suit his or her cultural requirements and of extending the literary horizon, horizon a bit further. This assumption should be carefully gone into and examined. Literary history, or even history of literature for that matter, is a concept that requires careful handling by a student of literature. I am not saying that there cannot be a history of the novel, theoretic theoretically speaking, but that it cannot be seen as independent of that larger history with its specific struggles to break free from existing shackles. It is really disappointing to see that reference to actual events, particular the economic and political ones, is missing in the discussions about emergence of the novel. One point three point two shift to prose in eighteenth century. Prose had seldom been a medium of serious creative endeavor before the the 18th century. Bearing a few exceptions, barring a few exceptions, writers of the past chose worse, longer poems, poetic drama, short poems of definite or indefinite length to share their views, experience or vision with the audience. That is how it had to be, since the audience consisted of the selected few. Till the middle of 17th century, the poems could also be found circulating 
among the narrow circle of friends and fellow writers because they were they alone were presumed to be appreciated appreciate imaginative work the idea of the mass readers who could be approached through the printed word emerged only in the 18th century why did something peculiar happen in that lit- in the later period the prose work in the 18th century came to look at some new issues in society and handle them with a seriousness hitherto unnoticed as said above one of these issues was marriage it was more than a subject of debate through the presentation which writer has was able to critique a particular relationship earlier the act of marriage reminded us of considerations of social propri- propriety class distinction and religion it was truly social for instance the restoration marriage the marriage encountered in the comic plays of the restoration period was between those men and women who came largely from the upper stratum the would be partners in marriage talked with some self consciousness they thought of choice need and purpose and finally joined each other in a traditionally accepted matrimonial schedule their background and social up- upbringing seldom allowing them to rethink or breach the social code of the male dominated family this family was a well established institution essentially reflecting the nature of the older social structure writers could not invest much through in an issue which remained personal this second could be seen only around the 17th of the previous century under the impact of recent upheavals or changes but matrimony could not be considered a significant point of living as women were to the home the higher plane of social existence associated itself with such vital principles as honor privilege acquisition of money etc however things changed radically in the first quarter of the 18th century compelling people to consider marriage as a whole set of new considerations morality ethics love courage commitment and what stood in the focus was not merely middle class men conscious alert and honest but the women the woman the new woman who becoming aware of a place in society who saw that new horizons of fulfillment and liberty had opened in the wake of socio political churning england had gone through the few decades before the epithet middle class is not to be is not to belittle or denigrate denigrate i don't know how to pronounce that denigrate the word of these people on whom it had fallen i'll repeat that part totally again the epithet middle class is not to be is not to belittle or denigrate the worth of these people on whom it had fallen to fiercely as well as intelligently confront the mighty word of privilege they were the common people of england who had moved upfront by dint of hard labor and industry and who not only asserted their rights to equality but also influenced the policy making of the nation they led to the lower masses in thought and attitude and effectively resisted the resisted the ways of the old tradition the kind of sharp ration, rational questioning self assurance a vigor found a true medium in prose the common people of england i repeat that again sorry the common people of england particularly the middle classes wanted to know and understand they enjoyed talking for them dialogue was more important than a statement 
since it's provided them an opportunity to question and disagree. They also aspire to theorize and philosophize and evolve through this a new way of responding to environment. They took pleasure in cracking jokes and playing with the language, playing with language. Far from being complacent about popular norms, they happily shocked their friends and critics alike. All this required larger accounts of representations. Fielding particularly exemplifies this activates of mass of people in England and he lets them talk in their natural style which is prose. The medium through which life in the market, in the street, on the road, at inn conducted itself. The novel as a new literary form. We have to think about the factor which inspire a writer to choose for to choose a particular form from those already existing or as happened in the 18th century evolve a new one so that it served an appropriate vehicle for this purpose the process of evolution of a form is highly complex because one can see in it a concrete dialectical intersection between a writer's urge to communicate and an environment which on its part is hardly passive, which persists in its threatening posture with the existing modes of expression. I particularly want to stress the presence of women, a whole lot of them, in the 18th century society, century society who had the leisure to relax at home with a book or periodical in hand as well as, inclina as inclination to know how to dress, walk, and converse, but also to contemplate upon the questions of the right and the wrong in life. They were no ordinary women. They were the wives of those, those men who had become more productive than the members of any other social group in the economic field, who organize, who organize manufacture from the procurement of the raw material and employment of the artisans to, to work with it to making available space for collective activity and looking after the deployment of correct methods that the artisan would use to turn out finished goods. More than this, they arranged money for all this activity which saw them through in the final activity of selling the goods in the market so that the profits came flowing in. It appears to be a simple activity of the economic kind on the surface, but is actually a highly challenging and problematic social activity affecting life condition as whole. This is because in the course of this endeavor, the involved men who were also creating a new value pattern, a novel way of making sense about tendencies that were thrown up in the life in the market. Still more, the market as a new powerful center of activity spread out to cover all vital areas of existence, including ideology and spirituality. Some significant developments could be seen in the 18th century in England on the literary cultural plane. Literary cultural plane. One of those was the rise of periodical, a magazine or pamphlet which sought to engage the average person in useful conversation. This average person was the middle class city dweller, the gentleman proper or the gentleman in the making who had an interest in the daily occurrences of life, who did not want to merely put two and two together but also to develop a no-nonsense pragmatic understanding to guide him. Such needs were earlier fulfilled in the case of the lower masses by a village parson who interpreted the age-old principles of life and behavior for the benefit of common purpose person. However, the difference between the need of the new middle class city dweller we have in mind and the common person with whom the parson communicated lay in their social positioning, the former also asking for pleasure 
while receiving while receiving moral guidance naturally enough this new gentleman in the making looked elsewhere for this service in the direction of non religious non religious secular agency <coughs> hence the fulfillment of the need by the peri periodical an instrument which did away with the compulsion of the going to a specific place at an appointed hour and instead provided the service at one's doorstep of course for availing oneself of the service one had to meet the precondition of literacy this the particular individual could well afford in the given social conditions in its infancy the novel incorporated some of the functions and the traits of the peri periodical One point three point four, the novel as comedy. Comedy in the eighteenth century differed immensely from then in the seventeenth century. It became lighter in vein and dealt with those issues which could be easily resolved. Take the case of social manners, under whose overall perspective question such as marriage and love. were considered by the writers the relationship of love became extremely important in social discourse in which great emphasis was laid on the individual choice the man and the women woman together took the decision to marry and thus set a not the pressures of the family so thus set at not the pressures of the family and society as a consequence of this emphasis in the 18th century as a consequence of this emphasis in the 18th century on decision making by the individual norms and principle of orthodoxy came under severe criticism one of the reason why an ordinary person became associated with the heroic qualities such as courage and fearlessness was that an important segment was that an important segment of society the middle class to be precise stood to gain from the protest and rebellion since that weakened the hold of the privileged section on social behavior under this logic marriage became a means for the middle class to question the values and the norms espoused by the entrenched interest the focus on the social manners takes us away from the serious questions of the work shelter and upkeep to provide to be provided by a society to its members only those who have solved the problems of bread and butter think of evolving a code of behavior the issues of virtue goodness morality and kindness which fall and the category of ethics and manners are of great interest to the progressive group progressive upcoming sections further the discussion further the discussions of the manners suggests that the members of this group have become individually capable of improving their behavior that they have merely to take close look at their norms and principles in order to adapt to a strategy to execute progress and improvement in the sense the improvement in manner is primarily a question of active choice the individual in such circumstances is expected to the expected to examine the nature of his her social environment okay i have to repeat this part again i think i have uh just read over the lines uh, here and there so here it goes again in the se in the sense the improvement in manner is primarily is primarily a question of active choice the individual in such circumstances is expected to examine the nature of his her social environment so that she or he 
can then take guidance from the rules that govern it. That the environment can be inimical, inim inimical and become an insurmountable, insurmountable, surmountable obstruction <laughs> and become an insurmountable obstruction is something that is beyond the imagination of this highly active and conscious entity. Uh, this part is quite uh, convoluted, so I'll read this again. <laughs> I have made so many mistakes uh, while reading. Further, the discussion of manners suggests that the member of this group have become individually capable of improving their behavior that they have merely to that and that they have merely to take a close look at their norms and principles in order to adapt a strategy to execute progress and improvement in this sense the improvement in a man in this sense the improvement in manners is primarily a question of active choice the individual in such circumstances is expected to examine the nature of his or her social environment so that she or he can then take guidance from the rules that govern it. That the environment can be inimical, inimical and become an insurmountable obstruction is something that is beyond the imagination of this highly active and conscious entity. I think I have to find this word. Inimical. 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 Okay. Okay, so we start again. I'm so sorry for this part. Under the perspective of manners, as we understand them, can we adequately define love and marriage? Well, love in such a case would be a relationship between two persons who are relatively free from social constraints. Society can certainly cause problems to them, but it would not prove more than a mere inconvenience. On the other hand, love for the man and the woman involved would be a challenge they have to meet in order to fulfill their wish. Love offers them to scope to draw upon their inner resources and assert, in the process of meeting it, their selfhood. Needless to say that the form of such a love, the journey to marriage, is more or less smooth affair. The union between the young people, even when they are socially unequal, one of them from a poor background and other belonging to the upper social stratum can cause raising of eyebrows and some clever scheming by a few to thwart it. But the criticism from orthodox quarters may at the same time inspire some other members in the society to stand the support of the lovers. This clash ending is merely, a rough, merely the ruffling of few feathers therefore does not lead to dangerous hostility and violence as it did in the past past were love and marriage challenges in the 16th and 17th centuries for the individual who were involved in the relationship the answer is obviously no neither love nor marriage could be separated from social structure that of the time it was a bond that decisively affected the elite in their pursuit of power, prestige, and honor, but were social and political events. They made statements about the families, dynasties, and the important streams of the traditional behavior to which the specific persons belonged and which came into the play when certain individuals decided to take the law in their own hands. <coughs> One point four. Let us sum up. One of the points on which the middle classes of the eighteenth centuries were exercised was transaction transition. 
The question the section confronted was how to interpret the change that was taking place around them in the world of manners and attitudes consequent upon the economic power they had come to acquire. There is no doubt that the change was desirable, but could it be pursued with vigor which is possible only when one is sure about the positive outcome. Obviously, the history could not be rolled back as entrenched interests of the landed gentry wished and whom the village parson in his religious wisdom tended to serve. We come across innumerable arguments against and in support of change in the books written in the 18th century in which modern was a much criticized word. At the same time, we notice a definite shrillness in the words of those who opposed change. Perhaps they were fighting a losing battle. One, on the other hand, the change in, the its change in itself did not denote anything specific and tangible. Because of this, one could clearly discern a vacuum in the spiritual territory. It so happened that the writer stepped forward to fulfill this vacuum through the mold of conversation in prose. 